This is the Transcend in Life podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson, taking you from fear to freedom. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Transcend in Life. I'm really excited to talk to this guest today. He is just, you know him as Action Jackson. Bobby Jackson is a 12-year NBA veteran and serves as the player development coach of the Sacramento Kings. Bobby attended University of Minnesota before being selected by the Seattle Supersonics in the 1997 draft. Some of Bobby's best years in the NBA was when he played for the Kings, where he was known as Action Jackson and truly a crowd favorite. Bobby was the NBA Sixth Man of the Year in 2003, Big Ten Player of the Year in 1997. He established the Bobby Jackson Foundation in 2004, a community-based organization created in honor of his mother. Bobby is currently establishing the Bobby Jackson Basketball Academy, which will open in January. He lives in Granite Bay, California with his beautiful family. Man, you're busy, and I know you got five kids. How do you pull all that off? Man, I don't I don't know. I, I think um, God, number one, and um, uh, prosperity, you know, figuring out how to get through life every single day. Um, but it's beautiful, though. It's a beautiful thing. I can only imagine five kids. I mean, that's a basketball team. It truly yeah. is. So you got a chance. Again, I was I was telling somebody the other day that you lived my dream. I grew up knowing nothing but wanting to play in the NBA. And you realized that dream. Not only did you realize it, you did it for 12 years. Tell me about that experience, man. That had to be just incredible. You know, the crazy thing about this, like we're having this conversation and, you know, I coached my daughter's AAU team. So last night we coming back, we drive, she practices and practice in Stockton. And so we commute three days a week back and forth. Um, and so last night I was telling her about my, my drive and my, my road to the NBA and how I got there and, the, the ups and downs that it had to take me and that I had to go through um, to get to the NBA. But at the age of eight or nine, I knew I wanted to be an NBA player. And I told my mom, I'm going to take care of you for the rest of your life and you ain't going to ever have to work again. Um, this was at eight or nine. Wow. Um, but it wasn't an easy path. It wasn't a, a easy road. Um, my road was probably probably one of the hardest ever because the one I wasn't highly ranked coming out of high school. Um, I wasn't highly recruited, um, and so the odds was against me to make it, and I had to go to JUCO. Um, so mo- when you think of a guy making it to the NBA, wasn't highly ranked, wasn't a McDonald's All-American, had to go to JUCO, his odds of making it to the NBA is very slim. Um, so I, I think a lot of things came into play. Number one, I was lucky. Number two, I was blessed, and I was an extremely really good athlete. Um, so all three of those things fell directly in line, and it kind of worked out from worked out from day one. So during that time, at eight or nine, to say I'm going to make it, and then again going to a junior college, you don't hear of a lot of players going from junior college and eventually being the NBA guys. You just don't. There are a few, but it's not the 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 path necessarily. Um, you had to have some doubts at some point, or did you just always believe? No, I always believed. I think my will and, and my work ethic, um, it kind of allowed me to be a little bit different than anybody else, you know. And, and I had to sacrifice um, hanging out, partying, drinking uh, for the betterment of what um, those riches would be down the road. Um, and so, and I think any kid, if you're listening, I think the biggest thing Number one, you got to have a, a, a drive and you got to have a work ethic. Um, number two, um, you got to be able to sacrifice. Um, hanging out with friends, partying, you got to be committed. You got to be all in. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it allowed me to grow. And I love working hard every single day. If you're not self-motivated, it's kind of tough to say that I'm going to be an NBA player. Some of those guys make it. But the ones that really make it are the ones that are, they, they are, they are self-motivated. And, and so I was self-motivated. I would get up, I would go to the park, I would play pickup basketball all day long. Whether it's rain, sleet, or snow, I'm out there working on my game. 
Well, and you, so not only did you make it, but 12 years, that's a long career, man. I mean, that is truly, guys, to me, I have this argument all the time with a good friend of mine. He's like, look, the secondary is the best athlete in the world. To me, NBA player is the greatest athlete in the world. It's not even close. And to do that for 12 years, you say being truly committed, and I talk about being interested or committed, that is true commitment. That is working day and night on your game, on your body. That's that's you can tell me more, but that's just that's so impressive. It's, I, I agree with you. It's super impressive to play twelve years in the league when people say you're only gonna play three, um, and then they say the saying, "Well, he ain't a point guard. He's too small. He doesn't shoot good enough." You know, and so for me, that kind of fueled me. And it kind of motivated me to get in the gym and work on my game um, and understand what did I need to do and how I needed to develop myself, not just physically, but mentally. Uh, because you're always going to have people saying you can't do this and you can't do that. Uh, but understanding what your niche is as a basketball player. Everybody can't come in and be a starter. Everybody can't come in and be a 20-point 20 20 point score. Everybody can't come in and be a 10-rebound or a 10 assist type of guy. You know, there's roles that you got to be willing to accept once you step in the NBA. And I think if you don't accept those roles, them to be the ones that find their way out of the league really quick. And I accepted that role. I knew I had to work really hard because I wasn't that really gifted as an athlete. As once you get to the league, I was okay athlete. But when you come across – Derrick Rose's, Russell Westbrook, um, those Stephon Marbury's, those guys is really get gifted and athletic. Like now you got to work more harder to maintain, but to be a presence on the floor. So what was that niche? Because again, you won NBA Six Man of the Year. That is a that is a huge award. That's a huge uh, you know feather in your cap. That's not easy. I'm sure you're used to starting all of your yeah. life. And then to develop into that, was that a transition, or did you embrace that role? No, it took me. A, it took me a while to figure that out. It took me at least about three or four years to figure out what my niche was. But I also believe being in the right place in the right situation, but also having the right coach believe in you, um, teach you the game, but also help develop you, but also give you a role that's more suitable to you. So it took me about three or four years. My first couple of teams, you know, I kind of went back and forth from being a role player to being a bench player, not getting any playing time. And it, and it really didn't break open until I got to Sacramento. Rick Adelman kind of believed in me, believed in me, showed me the ropes, um, and kind of sit me down and told me what my what his vision was for me, what my role was. And from there, I kind of accepted it. I didn't like it because I've never had that. But, of course, I wanted to be a starter. I felt like I was better than Jay Will. I felt like I was better than Mike Bibby. Uh, but he came to me as a man, and that's all you can ask. Hey, tell me what you need for me to do to be successful, for this team to be successful, and for me to be successful. And he broke it down to me. I need you to provide energy. I need you to come in and be consistent every single night. You're going to play 20 to 28 minutes a game based on how you're playing. And... It was up to me. Now you just got to develop and you got to get better. Um, you need to work on becoming a much better shooter off the dribble uh, and at the three-point line. So he broke all these things down to me. And for me, once you break all these things down to me, now it's up to me to go out and deliver. If I don't deliver, now it's my fault. So I kind of love coaches that really are up front, uh, that gives you the identity and gives you the confidence to go out and make mistakes and not willing to hold you back. And then he allowed me to grow um, in the midst of us having those really, really good runs. And I didn't get – I always played with coaches when I – like my first three years, I'm like, if I make a mistake, I'm looking over my head. <laughs> Got it. If I'm going to come out of the game. But here I knew I was going to play – a certain amount of minutes, regardless of the mistakes I made, he knew I was going to make up from those mistakes. And he knew he was, he, he allowed me um, the momentum, the, 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 the courage to go out and make mistakes, but he knew I was going to make up for them. 
Well, that team in the early 2000s, the the Kings, I mean, it just seemed from the outside looking in, the synergy and the camaraderie. And, I mean, again, if I look back and look at teams that you think, man, it's just a shock they didn't get that ring. And I know you're going against Kobe and Shaq, and I mean, yeah. one of the greatest dynasties ever, right? Um, but was there just the the real synergy, and was was it a tight unit the way it seemed like looking looking at the TV or at the games? Yeah, a very tight unit. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the one thing that we kind of prayed on and we laid our hats on. Uh, we, we supported each other uh, through thick and thin, uh, whether it's with um, functions, whether it was community-driven events, whether it's – our kids' birthday parties, whether it's weddings or um, holiday parties, like we supported each other on and off the floor uh, tremendously, and I think that's the true meaning of having a really good team when your t- when your guys can click on the floor and they can click off the floor, and it was um, a brotherhood, something that you had never like. I'll probably never experience that again because once you have so many guys fighting for one unbelievable goal, and that's to win the NBA championship, but we're all on the same page. I think it allows you to be so much better, and I think that's why we won 62 and 60 games and 58 and 55 games because we understood how we felt and we knew the chemistry and the makeup once we stepped on the floor. But off the floor, that helped develop the on court on court chemistry because we trusted and we believed in each other and we had each other back. It is amazing when you get that unit when you're like has that because I'm sure you've been on great teams like that, but I'm sure you've been on some dysfunctional teams as well. And when you find that man, you don't want to let that go. You still t- keep in touch with a lot of the guys from that squad. I actually do. I, I keep in touch with a lot of guys. I talk to Chris and Doug and Vladdy and Peja and Mike Bibby. Um, Hito every now and then, uh, Scott Pollard every now and then. So uh, the only person I probably don't talk to is probably Lawrence Funderburk and Jay Will. But me and Jay Will see each other out when he's at the games at Orlando. Um, but I do try my best to uh, maintain those open relationships and communications with my ex-teammates. That's cool, man. And so now you're still involved in the NBA. You're doing uh, player development work with the Kings. What do you see in, in this? Every generation talks about their generation yeah. versus this one versus, you know, the one before. And that's one of my favorite debates to talk about. What are you seeing right now? It's it's a different time, obviously, in the bubble. Yes. Um, I feel like they're shooting the ball like crazy, yeah. man. Yeah. Is that a depth perception thing? So I'm asking two questions. I'm sorry. What do you think? What's the difference between the generation you played in and the generation today? I mean, the generation now, and from what I play into now, number one, it's the athletes are totally different. And it's not a bad thing. I think when you look at the makeup of NBA players, when I play and NBA playing now, I think the game is a little bit more easier because the game was more physical back then. Um, we can hit, we can hard foul. Um, the game was played more inside than out. Um, and we didn't focus on shooting a lot of threes. Um, and you had more conventional bigs, um, that dominated the post. Now you got more guards dominating wing, dominating perimeter and shooting more threes. Um, and all everybody's doing is running for layups now. Um, so it's a totally different game. Shaq playing in today's NBA, will he dominate? Yes. Will he struggle? Hell yes. Because the game is so much faster, and there are six guys playing center now are 6'8 and 6'9. Wow. So he's going to struggle guarding those guard, those guys on the perimeter. Um, so, again, like I said, it's just the different dimensions of style of play that from 20 years ago or maybe 10, 15 years ago, to now that you have more shooters and, and more guard play that's elite at allowing themselves to be efficient scorers from the perimeter instead of being bigs uh, down in the post uh, dominating the paint. Well, I was watching the game last night, and to that point, Anthony Davis didn't get his first rebound till the third quarter. And I'm like, Dude. unacceptable. 
<laughs> he's six eleven and athletically freak. Unacceptable. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it's unacceptable, bro. Like I, I like me personally. Like if you seven feet tall and you got one rebound in third quarter, like you somebody need to tell you like you you ain't doing your job. Now you need we need you to rebound the ball for us to win this game. At seven feet, you got one rebound. Unacceptable. I, it, on any level, if you're the biggest person on the floor, you should be dominating the boards. But Denver plays a, a style of play, five out perimeter, and he's probably guarding Jokic on a perimeter the whole time. And so all the little guards are coming back, stealing all the rebounds. But again, uh, if I'm seven feet, I'm not having one rebound at, in the third quarter. It stopped me in my tracks when they said it because I'm like, that can't be right, man. Uh, tell me about the experience in the bubble. How was that? Because, again, I'm so happy basketball is back. Yeah. Um, are they shooting the ball better or does it just feel that way? Uh, I think, the number one, I think the bubble was extremely great. I think the NBA did a great job of um, putting together a great product but also putting together an environment where guys can feel safe Um at home, um, in a competitive environment where they're thriving. Um, the, the living situation was awesome. The activities was awesome. The food was just okay. <laughs> um, How was that coffee, man? Yeah, um, <laughs> coffee was sucked ass. Oh, my God. It's probably the worst coffee I've ever had, the most watered-down coffee. But outside of that, I mean, I can't complain about anything, man. I think – when you have a chance to go play in a bubble and do something special and do something that's never been done before in any type of sports history, um, to be a part of it was amazing. And I think the NBA did a phenomenal job at, at, at organizing that and putting that together. Yeah, it's been fun to watch for sure. Did you get out and shoot at all? And the reason I asked that, because you played in big arenas, mm -hmm. that's obviously much smaller to me, it feels like because the depth perception might be different. Yeah. Did you feel that at all? Yeah, it's it definitely like different. I think smaller arenas allows you to shoot the ball much better. Um, bigger arenas allows you to focus on the, the, the depth and the, the spacing. So I think that's why guys are shooting the ball extremely well right now because the arenas feel like small colleges. Um, and without the fans, you don't have a lot of yelling. You don't have a lot of anticipation you don't have a lot of screaming and yelling and booing and all that stuff so and then playing in a smaller environment court is regulation um and the facilities are nice it's just they just that they just don't have the spacing that normal arenas have again like they said the depth perception um is not a huge issue so that's why guys are coming out and playing um amazing basketball and they're playing at a really high level that's it's definitely fun to watch. I want to go back to some of you as a parent. You have five kiddos. And like you said, you got knocked down a little bit. You know, maybe you didn't get to the university right out of the gate where you wanted to go. My question is, how what was your process for when you failed, quote unquote, or didn't achieve what you wanted? Was it adding a little chip to the shoulder? Did you said it drove you? How mm -hmm. how do you kind of teach your kids some of that? I'm just that process. Man, that's a, actually a really good question. You know, when you have kids, you always, you know, you always want to teach them how you was raised. But when you're dealing with different, a different culture, you're dealing with a, a different um, age group um, that, and a different culture of how kids think, you know, my main, I can be rough and rugged all day long. Um, but when you have four girls, you have to really understand that you can't be rough and rugged all the time. But my number one key to my kids is I try to allow them, I want them to make mistakes. But when you make those mistakes, how are you going to respond? Are you going to give up? Are you going to put your head down? You're going to walk away and you're going to sulk? Or are you going to try to fix the problem? And so I try to allow my kids to make those mistakes. I don't want to be there to pick them up. and I want them to fall down on their face and get back up and allow themselves to continue to grow um, and see what the true um, vision is and the true love that they have for it, whether it's in school. Uh, in school, they don't have it. They don't have no – they can't 
say I'm quitting. You know, that's the one thing that they can't not say they're not going to do. But when it comes to sports, I don't push my kids to play sports. Um, in everyday life, teaching them how to be great individuals, saying yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Like, you can't say, huh, in my house. <laughs> you know, so for me, it's just morals and how I was brought up. You know, so there's a lot of different ways of how I raise my kids. Um, but the biggest thing is just allowing them, giving them the confidence to go out and be young, um, intelligent, um, powerful, strong individuals that believes in themselves. That's cool because I know even I fall into the trap where I, I, you want to protect your kids. Yes. But, man, you got to let them fall off the bike, scrape yeah. their knee, and get get back on. I'm, I'm asking this almost tongue-in-cheek because I, I think I know the answer. But participation trophy, I can't imagine you're that kind of guy. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I don't want my I don't, I don't want my kids to have a get a third place trophy or a second place trophy. You know, I think uh, I I've found a way to earn a good living and to be a really good basketball player. And nobody really gave me anything. Uh, I'm not disappointed in it that most parents want their kids to receive a third and, and, and second second and third place trophy. I'm just not that. Type of parent, you know, I think um, how I was raised, I think, you know, trophies is is now is organization of giving kids trophies because of participation. And I'm not. What are we telling our kids Like we're giving them a third place trophy? Guess what we're saying? Well, guess what? In life, guess what you're going to get. If you don't work hard, even if you're not the victor, even if you don't really deserve it, that's saying, well, I already got this sense of entitlement. So that's going to stay with them. It's not showing them that, well, man, I just, I got to figure out how to get back up. I got to figure out, get back up how to tie my shoes. I got to figure how to get back up and not be in the second place to be in first place. So there's nothing wrong with teaching your kids to fight through adversity. I think giving those trophies, those trophies doesn't, doesn't allow your kids or it's not teaching your kids to fight through adversity. And I think that's what life is about. You're going to find some you know, some shape, some form, where you got to fight through adversity. And when the bricks are down, how are you going to fight through? How are you going to climb through that wall? Are you going to hit it and you're going to relax? Or are you going to hit it and you're going to plow your way through it? Um, so that's just my thought, my thought process in it. So you have the Bobby Jackson Basketball Academy coming, man. And I know COVID kind of probably threw a wrench in the mix. Big, <laughs> wrench, big wrench, big <laughs> wrench, big um, wrench. What is the vision there, man? What are, you, what are you trying to accomplish with that, obviously, other than just basketball? Because one of the things that always seems like there's always lessons behind everything you're doing. And obviously, basketball probably taught you a ton, yes. as, as it did me. So what, what what's the vision with the academy? Man, it's number one is just – Building, growing, and developing young individuals and giving them um, an identity um, outside of basketball. You know, Basketball is really good, but if you can't teach somebody how to be a great individual, how to be a, 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 a great communicator, shake somebody's hand when you look them in the, when you look them in the eye, um, talk with your, your head held high. Don't talk, don't have a conversation with somebody looking down at the ground. Like, so those type of things have been manifested in me as a little kid. Um, and so some of those kids don't have that type of structure or organization or discipline within their life. And so I think that's what the one thing that the Bobby Jackson Academy is going to bring. It's going to bring, it's going to bring some structure, it's going to bring some discipline, it's going to bring some organization. But on top of that, the number one thing that it's going to bring is skill development um, and the ability to get better as a basketball player um, throughout the city of Sacramento. I've been here for since 2000. This is my home. Um, and the, there's so many kids that really want to be involved with basketball. And I think it's a great avenue to teach them the right way um, and the right concept that comes with being a really good basketball player. Um, and I think that's what the Bobby Jackson uh, Basketball Academy is going to stand for. So any parent or 
child listening to this and you're like, man, I want you to work on this one to three skills. Like if yes. you really want to succeed, I'm not talking even the look, the likelihood of them playing college ball or certainly pro is it's not great. Let's yes. just say the odds are not there. But if you really want to give your very, very best, is there two or three things where you're like, gosh, I wish kids would work on this. Yeah. Number one, I think fundamental fundamentals is a huge thing that's lacking in today's sports. And it's not just basketball. It's universal. It's all sports. Um, so I would say, number one, be fundamentally sound. Number number two, be a good ball handler. Uh, and number three, because the game has transitioned into shooting, become a really good shooter. So fundamentals, ball handling, and shooting. Um, it's the three things that I really, really focus on. Um, starting with the fundamentals, breaking the game down bit by bit, piece by piece, um, whether it's a jump stop, whether it's a um, a, trip, a, a triple threat uh, move, um, whether it's a pass. Um, so the game will be broken down in so many different segments um, that the kid will start to see the improvements, but I'm a true believer in repetition. Uh, the more reps you get at becoming a much ball handler, the much – the more reps you become at make it becoming a great passer, um, I think it allows you to grow and it expands your game tr- uh, uh, dramatically. Yeah, man, I just – and I'm thinking of how many hours I'm sure you put in. Yeah. And let's talk about that for a minute. So when you talk work ethic and you're talking really being committed, what did that look like for you as, as that eight- or nine-year-old that said, Mom, I got you, you're going to be taken care of. But that meant – Hours yeah, every day, yeah, every day. So, what did that look like? Seven days a week, every day. Um, it, it kind of more consisted of, of of me playing pickup basketball every day. Um, didn't really have the the skills and drills and the skill development as a little kid. I didn't get into that until later down the road into college and and, and being a pro. Wow. Yeah, and so for me, it was more playing pickup basketball against older guys every single day. And then occasionally I'll go to the park by myself and shoot every single day. Um, so I did one or the other if there wasn't enough guys to play. But I'm at the park every single day by myself or with older playing against older guys, just working on my game. So that allowed me and gave me a work ethic and a drive um, – once I got to college and once I got to the league, it sh- it, it kind of stayed with me. So that developed that that kind of crept into me as a little kid, you know, starting at eight, nine, nine, ten, ten, eleven, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. You know, it just stuck. It just stuck with me. Um, so the work ethic, you know, coming from my mom, like she worked hard, single mom, worked two jobs, taking care of me and my sister. You know, I was like, you know, she's working too hard. Like, if she's working hard, guess what I got to do? I got to work even harder um, just to provide a lifestyle um, and provide food and, and shelter and clothes uh, for me and my sister. So I, I knew I had to stay on the level, especially on the basketball side, if I wanted to be successful, even if I wanted to go to college. I was the first guy to go to college in my, in my, uh, in my family. Wow. So it was something that I knew I wanted. I knew it was in reach. Um, but I had to put my mind to it to uh, achieve those goals. So you're talking about your mom, and you obviously started a foundation in her memory. Tell me about that. What's that all about? Oh, man. Yeah, my mom died of breast cancer in 2004, and I think um, the reason why I started because I didn't know anything about breast cancer. I didn't know anything about cancer. You know, as a, uh, as a young man, you know, uh, it was some one of the things that really hit me hard, and I was like, what? I had to take it. I take. I had to look. I had to Google and see what was cancer, um, because I didn't. I was oblivious to it, and I didn't know what it meant, and I didn't know um, the effects that it can cause. Um, and so, once I did that, I was truly scared. But forming this, the foundation, it was in her name. It was in her honor, um, and I started because I wanted to fight uh, cancer, and I wanted to try to get an end, find an end and a cure for it. And I think the biggest thing for me it was allowing uh, my kids to see uh, a legacy and to see something being, my mom being honored in a great, great vision and a great 
way that complements her as a young woman and as a mother and a grandmother. So that was the reason why I started it. I wanted to, you know, give her some 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 insight, but also um, give her the vision, but also acknowledge all the things that she's done for me and my twin sister. Um, and the Bobby Jackson Foundation is still thriving and, and driving and working in the community. Um, and it's still uh, helping communities uh, throughout the city of Sacramento. Oh, that's awesome, man. I, I love that you started that, you followed through with it, continue to today. One thing maybe I've forgotten, but thinking back, so that was during some pretty peak basketball for you. Yes. For that to happen when you were playing at such a high level, I always talk about when one thing's out of, you know, that's that's adversity that you're facing personally. Mm-hmm. How do you show up and perform in a professional level the way that you did? Because that takes a lot of strength, man. Yeah, it is, man. I think, you know, I've always said, I, like, my mom was probably my best friend. I was a mother's – I'm a mama's boy. Um, and so to see her go through that terrible ordeal, uh, but she's probably one of the strongest individuals that I know uh, because of how hard she worked. Because of being a single mom, uh, providing for me and my twin sister the resilience um, and the fortitude and the work ethic that she bestowed amongst me, you know, giving me the morals, um, teaching me how to be humble and um, being competitive at the same time um, and treating people with respect. So uh, it's definitely it definitely was hard. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. When you watch a family member um, going through a terrible ordeal of being sick, it kind of takes your mind away from it. But I think the biggest thing for me is once I stepped on the floor, like that was, that was heaven to me. Mm. Um, I only thought about it when I got off the floor. Um, So basketball was, was a safe haven for me, you know, it allowed me to, uh, and it may sound selfish at some times, but it was my safe haven. You know, when I got off the floor, I knew I was more dedicated to helping my mom become a much better person, being by her side. And I think that was the one thing that basketball really helped. It helped me get away from the stress of watching my mom um, deal with a terrible battle with cancer. Um, And so it's just, for me, it it allowed me to refocus and re-energize myself and go out and dominate and fight something. You know, when I stepped on the floor, I said, I'm fighting cancer. And it allowed, and it stuck with me, you know, throughout my whole career. I'm fighting cancer every single day, you know, whether my four girls, you know, having a mother that passed away, I look at my four girls and never want them to go through it. And it's, it's real when you have a mom that died of cancer, the only thing you can think about is envisioning your kids having cancer. So when I step on the floor, I'm fighting cancer every single day. Damn, you uh, you still have that outlet, man? Because obviously you're not playing. Yeah. But uh, what is that outlet when you need that? When when you really need to be able to get lost? As you're almost, I could, I was, as you were talking, I you could see you almost get lost yeah. talking about it. Yeah, I, I mean, there are a couple of things that allow me to get lost. Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing is I'm a, like a lot of people don't know that I'm a big time family guy. You know, I love spending time with my kids. I love being around them. I love coaching them. I love watching them grow. Um, So I think that's my biggest, the number one thing. I love spending time with my kids, even when they're 26, 24, 19, 17, and 11. Um, And so I think that would be the number one thing. And then I think the next thing is golf. Golf gives me a, a, a piece of serenity, especially when it's a really nice golf course. You know, I think that's the one thing that allows me to just, it's four hours, right? With my busy schedule, work, kids, golf is the one outlet that I know that I can just get away for four and a half hours and I can just take in the outdoors. I can smoke me a stick and I can hit the golf ball and and it's kind of like heaven to me. Um, So those two things right there is, probably my two things that allows me to get away and, and not uh, reflect on a lot of negativity. Uh, it it kind of brings a lot of po- positivity in my life. Yeah, he's a legit stick too, guys. I mean, <laughs> I, I saw it from my own eyes from the tips. 
I think you shot like a 77 quiet from the tips. Maybe it was even better, man. Yeah, it was that was actually that was probably the best time. That was my best score at Granite Bay, playing from the tips. And I kind of challenged myself. I like playing from the tips. I think the only way to become a really good golfer is play from the tips. And I really focused on working on my game and mastering a couple of things, whether it's chipping and putting, um, but mastering my irons. Um, so um, golf is something that I, I, I take pride in, in in doing, but I don't want Doug Christie to beat me any. any <laughs> he told me he's coming. I man. know he's coming. So that's why, that's why I take pride in it. I can't allow him to be talking shit to me every single day. Those hands, man, I don't think you missed a chip. I mean, it was like, all right, it's good. Pick it up, Bobby. I mean, it's unbelievable. Get back to basketball just for a second because I, I, I grew up loving watching basketball. That's how I learned half the stuff I did is watching. Did you have a someone you really looked up to, somebody that you were like, that's the game I want? Uh, I mean, I looked at a lot of guys, and I think that's the great thing about being a basketball player or being an athlete, you look at guys that you want to patent your game after. And at the time, growing up as a kid, number one, it was Michael Jordan, um, who was arguably the best scoring guard to ever grace the, the earth. And then I look at Magic Johnson. I look at Isaiah Thomas. Um, so you look at the flash that Magic had. You look at the, the razzle-dazzle. Um, the Isaiah had, and then you look at the athleticism and the competitive, tenacious drive that Jordan had. So you look at those three guys, and I'm just like, man, like I kind of wanted my game to be like it. It wasn't nowhere close. Um, but those three guys inspired me. Uh, but Michael Jordan, by far, he inspired me more because he was from North Carolina. Yes, he is. He's still proud of it still today, man. I, I, I assume you watched The Last Dance as well? Yes, without oh, doubt. Oh, my God. Great. So great show. good. Yeah, great show. Great show. Daddy. Well done. Do you have your Mount Rushmore? You have your top five? Oh, man. If you got it off the top of your head, go. If I not, actually don't have it off the top of my head, but I would probably say um, number one, probably if it, it would be Mike. How many people on Mount Rushmore? Uh, five or four. We're I, it, but we're gonna make it basketball. It's, it's gonna be team, five. So we're gonna it's go gonna be five. five. Okay. Yeah, by position or just straight away. Straight away. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm gonna put Mike in that. I'm gonna put Allen Iverson at the point. Oh, hey now. Yeah, Mike at the two. Um. Kevin Durant at the three. Wow. Um. LeBron at the four. He's just that big. He yeah. can play four. <laughs> but no, I'm gonna put KD at the four. I'm okay. gonna put I'm gonna put Kobe at the three. Kobe at the four and LeBron at the five. Wow. That's a, that's so I'm gonna have really KD, fast I'm gonna, yeah, lineup. exactly. So I'm gonna have KD and LeBron playing four or five, Kobe at the three, Mike at the two, and AI at the point. So you you have a grown accustomed to this game, man. So would your game today would it be even better? I mean, does it play more to your strengths? I mean, I think it plays way to my my strength because I'm athletic. I love to play fast. Um, I wasn't a really good shooter. Now, I mean, with the work ethic that I know I would, I mean, I think this game would be a little bit easier for me mm. because I was a physical guard, and you know. Probably would have been a little bit more foul trouble, but being able to get to the basket and exploding and, and, and taking advantage of the open space and, and the creativity off the bounce, yeah, I, I would have done a great job in this league, I think. Um, but who said, Who knows? You know. But I, I, it's all about having that confidence and being able to say, you know what, I think I can compete in that league. And to do it for 12 years, I think when you can play in the NBA in 12 years, I think you can play in any generation. Now you just got to accustom you. You got to get your game accustomed to how that style of play is being played. You know, guys now, how will they manifest back playing 20 years ago? You get what I'm saying? So you put them in our style of play, will they be successful in it? Because it's a much physical league. Pace is slower. Inside-out game. Mm. Um, now you're playing with 
more guards, more athleticism, more creativity, more guys that can shoot the basketball. Nobody shoot more red, mid-range games. Like, I was a mid-range shooter. That doesn't really exist much no, anymore. No, no more. So now I got to back it up and I got to shoot from the three-point line. I think that adds, a, that adds a little bit more dynamic to me because I can get to the rim at ease. So now you got to back up and respect my speed. I got you. So now I'm going to be able to shoot it once I work on my, my shooting off the bounce. So uh, I think I would have done great, you know, but who knows? I am no. I know you would, and there's no doubt. I got to ask one more basketball question just because – I, I'm always curious. Who is the toughest guy for you to check? Allen Iverson. Oh, man. Without a doubt. <laughs> really? Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, I always tell people that. Like, when you have the ability to shoot 30 times a game, how, how in the hell are you going to be able to guard that? You can't guard anybody to shoot. that gets an opportunity to shoot 30 times a game. 20 to 30 times a game is unbelievable. And then he's getting to the free throw line 10 to 12 times a game. Uh, and his speed and his athletic is Probably superior, superior, more superior to any other guard that's going that he's going to face. So for me, it was Allen Iverson. Man, he was so fast. Yeah. I can't and even he was imagine tough, trying though. to. Was he, he really was tough? Yeah, like you couldn't punk him. You thought you was going to be physical with him. Like that didn't bother him at all. Like he just came to play, and that's the one thing I respect about him. Like regardless of what everybody said about him, how he partied and how he part- drank every single night. Came to show up. He, he showed up every single night. It's pretty amazing. Um, I got to ask just because I ask every guest, and it's my favorite question. Mm-hmm. It's a little more serious getting off hoops for a minute. Yeah. But uh, what does freedom mean to you? What does that look like in your life? Wow. I mean, that's a really good question. Freedom. What does freedom look like um, in my life? I think freedom for me, uh, it's about justice, equality, uh, everybody being treated the same, um, fairness. Um, I think in the times that we're in right now, um, teaching your kids how to treat not just the short guy or the fat guy or uh, the handicapped guy, treating everybody the same. Mm. So freedom comes with, you know, courage, um, a voice, um, sticking up for not just you, but sticking up for somebody else who can't defend themselves. Um, but I think we're in a society now that uh, it doesn't want to teach that. It wants to stay in the old 400 years of how we thought and how we was raised so and how things were done. And so freedom allows us to, number one, when it's 2020, you know, and I think having the freedom to go out and walk out your door and voice and speak your opinion, um, it's your entitlement. But I think everything has to be done respectfully um, within the right mind, um, being treated equal. You know, I think that's the biggest thing for me. When my kids walk out that door, I want them to be able to be treated equal. And I want them not to be discriminated against. I don't want them to be humiliated because of their skin color. Um, so freedom comes in so many different angles and so many different versions. Um, but when you think about your kids, you want them to walk out that door and you want them to have a voice. You want them to feel appreciated. You don't want them to be second guessing themselves. Um, and so it allows them to grow into strong, uh, healthy individuals and productive citizens in this uh, in this beautiful country. So that's obviously a big job today yes. to, to do that. Is that just a concerted effort with your kids daily, talking to them about this? Yeah, I, th- that's the great thing about where we're at. I think it, as a country, as a community, um, and, and, and as, as a society, it, it allows you to – Talk to your kids, but it allows you to just listen to them sometimes. And sometimes they may have an opinion, and you just listen, and you be like, mm, okay. But now as a parent, now I can just step back, and I can give you my, my opinion on what I think. But at the end of the day, it's about 
helping them get through this chaotic 2020 that it's probably, I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, bro, this is probably the worst I've never seen, in my 47 years, I've never seen anything like this. Whether it's the virus, the pandemic, whether it's the fires, uh, whether it's elections, whether it's um, the, the, the brutal killings, whether it's on the racism, like I've never seen our country and our society be in so much turmoil. Um, but as kids, like you allow your kids just to have a voice, have an opinion, but guide them and let them formulate their own mindset and formulate their own opinion. And as a parent, you just want to guide them and give them the right information um, once they walk out the door because um, it, it just allows them to be much stronger individuals. Yeah, man, along with a lot of love, right? I no. mean, we, we just need to keep giving them love, man. Yeah. Can't, can't stop doing that, man. That's, that's the number one thing that you got to do as a parent. You got to continue to love them, guide them, give them, the, give them the information, but hopefully they make those right decisions once they step out the door. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you're like, man, I need to share this with everybody. I want the audience to hear this. No, man, I think you touched on everything. You know, uh, I'm a fairly simple guy, um, very low-key, very quiet. So I think you've done a phenomenal job of, of, of touching up on every aspect of my career and talking about family, talking about my career, talking about sports, my foundation, my business. So I think you've done a great job. Appreciate that. Well, brother, I appreciate you being here. I, I appreciate the way you show up in the community. You've always just been such a humble, nice, just outgoing guy. You know you are laid back, but at the same time, you give love, man. And so I just appreciate you always doing that and coming on today. Oh, man, no problem. Thanks. Anytime. Anytime you need me, just let me know. I'll be here. All right. I appreciate you. Guys, go to letsgowin.com. Check out the work-life balance Go download it. It's free to you. I use it every month. In the meantime, continue to transcend in life. Thank you so much for listening. If this content is delivering value to you, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us. That helps us build this community, and that is what we are all about. Building this community as big as we can, helping as many people as we can, and deliver as much value as possible. Be sure to head over to TranscendentLifePodcast.com for information on my coaching courses and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Let's Go Win 365. Let's go win and transcend in life. This is the Transcend in Life Podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson, taking you from fear to freedom.